from the perspective of total treatment cost, uh, how does the cost of CRISPR stem cell treatment compare to the lifetime cost alternative treatments in use today? Yeah, good question. Uh, you know, I think, um, and, and this is a pretty generic um, answer that, that I think is broadly applicable to uh, all cell and gene therapies. So one of the uh, potentials of cell and gene therapies, including CRISPR-edited stem cells or, or just CRISPR-based therapies, is that they are potentially curative. And so if, if they are curative, and if you have a chronic disease like sickle cell or beta cell, and if you, you know, do, do the um, uh, cost-benefit analysis, like how much uh, does chronic management of sickle cell cost over the lifetime of the patient versus a one-time infusion of a gene-edited stem cell? Uh, if you do th those types of uh, calculations uh, and you project out into the future, it becomes very clear that gene therapies and cell, cell therapies, if, if they are effective in the clinic, have a uh, potential to significantly reduce healthcare costs in terms of chronic uh, treatment. But, you know, the major challenge is that, you know, with, with a cell and gene therapy, a lot of that cost is uh, put up front uh, versus uh, long-term, uh, you know, in, 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 in incremental, uh, you know, uh, doses. So like, you know, for example, the most expensive gene therapy today is uh, the one that's uh, sold by uh, Novartis for, um, for uh, SMA, which is a uh, inherited disease of the uh, nervous system, spinal muscular atrophy. So it's an AAV gene therapy. I believe uh, Novartis has priced it at over $2.1 million. Uh, and they've uh, based that on, uh, okay, if you look at the uh, total lifetime uh, treatment of these patients, it exceeds $2.1 million. Uh, on an uh, annual basis, it's probably three to $500,000. So if you assume a patient lives for 20 or 30 years, it's going to be, uh, you know, logs more expensive to chronically treat that patient over their lifetime versus a one and done infusion of the uh, gene therapy. And so I think the, uh, you know, based on what we've seen so far with cell and gene therapies, you know, if, if they remain durable, that they could uh, lead to significant cost savings. But I think for drug developers, it's going to be about figuring out a model that enables them to recoup the uh, investment that they've put in. And, you know, what does that look like? Is it a massive, you know, um, uh, lump sum at the beginning uh, that the patient has to incur or that the health system incurs? Or is it like an annuity system? So for every year that the gene therapy works, you, you pay a uh, portion of the cost but it, but it gets, uh, you know, amortized over um, the lifetime of the uh, patient. And I think the answer to that is there really is no good uh, answer, <laughs> essentially, today. Yeah, because it, it really it involves uh, many, many different moving parts. You have the payers, the uh, insurance companies, the drug developers, and the patients themselves. Remember, at the end of the day, it's the, the patients that if their health insurance doesn't foot the bill, they have to take that on. And so... You know, from an ethical perspective, what can we as a society expect from the patient versus what can we expect from the drug developers? Because remember, a lot of these therapies do come from taxpayer-based funding. So, you know, they come out of academic institutions. They come out of the NIH. They come out of other health, uh, you know, organizations. So what, um, you know, realistically, what, what can the uh, government and what can the citizens expect from drug developers, but then the flip side, what should the drug developers expect from the insurance companies and the uh, patients? And I think it's still, it, because it's these are new technologies, there's really no good answer to any of these uh, questions. No, I, I understand and I appreciate it. It's a very thick, heavy topic that we could dedicate an entire Cell and Gene Live event to. So, uh, but I, I appreciate your thoughts on that. Uh, what are your thoughts on gene insertion uh, as opposed to gene knockout uh, using CRISPR? Are, and is, are you, meaning VOR, are you using this strategy? Yeah, good question. So we're not currently using uh, gene insertion, but gene insertion has been used by other groups. And the basic concept is this. You know, you use um, the CRISPR-Cas enzyme to specifically knock out a, a gene but then you have a donor template that encodes another uh, gene of interest uh, that, that then gets introduced into that break site. 
And so in that way, you can introduce a brand new gene in, in that site of interest. So it's been used, um, I think one of the first uses was within the context of uh, cancer immunotherapy. So uh, the group uh, from Michelle Satellane um, uh, at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, what they proposed to do is uh, to knock out the uh, TCR locus of uh, T cells and knock in um, the uh, chimeric antigen receptor construct. So, you know, I think in, in, in T cells, it's proven to be extremely effective. In hematopoietic stem cells, um, this knock-in uh, concept that, that's being asked by the questioner, I think it's, it's proven to be a bit more challenging and a bit more inconsistent. Uh, so, you know, we, we're, we're working towards that aim, and I think many other companies are working towards that aim, but it's not um, as uh, straightforward as it is with uh, T cells. Sure, okay. Uh I think we might have time for about two more audience questions. And so the first I want to ask you is uh, earlier at the top of the call, you talked about three successful uh, CRISPR-based clinical trials. Do you have any examples of CRISPR trials failed? Yeah. Um, so, you know, maybe not a failure, but it's sort of a, um, a, a good lesson for the field. And, and this was this this trial got a lot of uh, publicity. This was the uh, trial in China where the uh, investigator edited the embryos. So these were um, embryos. Uh, he edited, uh, knocked out the uh, CCR5 uh, gene to essentially demonstrate that he can do it in embryos and that he can use those embryos within the context of IVF. He implanted those gene-edited embryos into a uh, surrogate, and then the uh, surrogate gave birth to these uh, CRISPR gene-edited individuals. So that had never been done before, and that's been extremely, um, you know, um, considered to be very unethical because when you do introduce that edit in the embryo stage, you could introduce off-target effects that could have some really deleterious impact on the uh, baby on the uh, developing child could lead to other uh, impacts. So, you know, I would consider that a, 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 an ethical uh, failure more than a technical failure because, you know, thankfully the, uh, the, uh, the, the children were born and they seemed to be healthy. You know, they seemed to have no deleterious impact on them. You know, they're still young, but, you know, God forbid, had, had that gone, you know, wrong, that could have been, uh, you know, uh, someone's life at stake just because of some cavalier attitude towards gene editing. So I would consider that an ethical failure in terms of how CRISPR was used. And that's something that immediately sent shockwaves in the field. So, uh, you know, this um, trial took place in China. And, you know, many people have the perception that clinical trials are uh, sort of like the Wild West in China. But to the uh, credit of the uh, Chinese government, they immediately shut down the uh, lab of this investigator and they immediately, um, you know, uh, penalized him for this type of effort. So I think, you know, it's um, it's it's inaccurate to say that, you know, China is the Wild West, because here in, in this type of a, of a matter, you know, they did take it very seriously, like they should have. And the field took it very seriously as well. So it's an ethical failure. But I think the response of the field has been extremely heartening because it shows that, you know, there, there is sort of this ethical standard that, that all countries are, are, are willing to enforce, you know, to, to make sure that this is deployed in a safe and effective manner. Hopefully that holds up as, as the technology develops. You know, we don't want like a cavalier or a rogue investigator in a rogue country, you know, doing something that could set the field back, uh, you know, years, if not decades. Great. Okay. Uh, before we sign off, we certainly have to talk about what's next. And so uh, that was one of my questions anyway. Uh, but this, I'll ask this particular audience member's question, which is, we had talons, ZFNs, piggyback tools, and now we have CRISPR. Uh, can you envision as to the next gene editing 3.0 tool? What's next? <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I mean, if I could uh, predict that, um, I probably wouldn't be here today. You know, I'd, I'd uh, build, be building it myself. But I think, like you know, if we look at the trajectory of where the field is going, like you know, what's next is gene editing modalities that uh, are are more precise and that can be delivered 
intravenously. So right now, a lot of the gene editing platforms, you know, I think uh, people, uh, for, for safety reasons and just delivery issues, they're very difficult to deliver just like intravenously directly into the, into the blood system. And I think the future of gene editing is we're going to get more precise gene editing uh, modalities, maybe more precise versions of CRISPR uh, gene editing that'll enable you to be much more precise in terms of the edits that you make in the genome. But then another thing that, that could be on the horizon is just, um, you know, more um, uh, gene editing modalities that are more amenable to direct delivery into the patient. So rather than manipulating a cell ex vivo, like a stem cell, and then infusing that gene edited stem cell into the, into the patient, it, what I'm talking about is just using that gene editing modality and directly infusing it into the patient, so avoiding that middle step. And so I think that could be on the horizon in the next uh, decade or so. Uh, so, you know, that's where I see the field going is that, you know, we're going to get gene editing platforms and delivery mechanisms that will be much more specific and much more uh, precise in terms of how they um, carry out the, their, their uh, function.